Are we live? Hello, everybody. Welcome to Woodworking Wisdom. Um, that's just as well I wasn't picking my nose or anything, is it? Um, so anyway, uh, what we've got to do today is a little bit of spindle turning. No, really keen on the spindle turning, my skew chisels and things like that. So um, what I want to do really is just go over um, uh, a little bit of longer wood turning. So you know, before I've been able to hide behind uh, short pieces short projects uh, you know but this time i thought let's let's plan um something that might be of use to you so we're going to do a newel post to start with and then we're going to go on to a staircase spindle um the staircase spindle is going to be quite small now staircase spindles tend to um sort of they well they can start at 32 mil uh, across which is really really thin when you think they can go up to between 900 and 1100 mil long um, you know, you're going to get a huge amount of whip. So there's a huge, a, a huge skill level increase when you start going into longer pieces. Um, so we're going to start with new post, like I say. Even now, though, I was um, talking to Matt. Matt's on the the questions and the and the trickery behind the cameras and stuff. Um, I was talking to Matt earlier. Um, and I was put my hand in, I was just doing this and I can feel the vibration front. This is quite a big piece. It's about 75 mils, about three inches. Um, so this is quite a big piece. Um, so there will be vibration. We're going to look at um, uh, uh, well, a meter long uh, staircase spindle as well. So we've got to deal with pummels and all those sorts of things. Um, and we're also going to look at, you would have seen in the uh, in the picture to promote today's stream, we're going to look at uh, center steady. So just some tools that might make things a little bit easier for you. We've got a good uh, range of cameras going on today. I've got lots of confused looks from Matt. Are we all get all cool, Matt? Are we all good? We've got some buffering, really. We're all connected, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. Um, make sure the Wi-Fi is not on. Make sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just carry on. We'll pretend that, to, that everything's fine. If there are major issues, we have had actually this, probably the last sort of three live streams, we had massive issues. If you remember last week with Jason's, we had to call it a day and, um, and, uh, and, and put a, uh, a recorded one up. This is what it is sometimes it's thundering outside at the moment i don't know whether you just heard that but we've got a lot of weather going on around us whether that makes a difference i don't know um but i'm just going to carry on so new post i've got a square a pencil we're just going to pretend that we have um uh, even pummels i've actually marked in seven inches from ends Again, if you know me, I'll be mixing around between metric and imperial all the time. I just find that I, it's easier to be able to use both. And then you go to, as long as you're not copying a plan, of course, um, if you're able to use both, then you can use the most convenient for that job at the time. Um, and some are going to require metric, some are going to require uh, imperial measurements. So we're going to carry on. Uh, my apologies if you've got any buffering going on. Um, let's hope it's only just an isolated bit at the very beginning. And we're going to start off with the the, um, the nice skew chisels. So if remember the um, the splay tool the splay skews that i enjoy using um so the signature skews this is a nice thin skew but i'm using the the widest one of the, that i have available to me and this one's 30 mil uh, wide so it's quite a quite a biggie um and to start with i want to cut in these uh, pummels at the end so the pummels if you didn't know um i have spoken about pummels fairly often but a pummel on a piece of timber, are these square sections at the end, and this is a fairly short staircase spindle, but they're the square sections. If you don't cut them in first, what you'll find is uh, as you start to rough down, you can split corners away so your pummels will disappear. So um, just to be aware of that. So we're going to cut the pummels in first, and that's basically an upright V cut. So get my control box at hand, or I can get to it quickly. Lay speed to zero, of course and then turn the lathe on. I have already checked to make sure we've got nothing touching the tool rest. Everything's nice and tight. I've double checked the tail stock, double checked the head stock. Um, so lathe, speed, the lathe on and turn the lathe up. Now I can see the lines that I've drawn here, both head and tail, I can see those. Um, so I can go straight to them. Um, what you'll find on camera, you probably won't. You'll see all sorts of weird sort of images on camera, um, but I'm stood right in front of that line. So it's quite bold, I can see it easily. I'm going to start to um, my the left of my line, so the waist area side of my line, and we'll do an upright cut first, then a slight tilt, and I'm using the toe of the skew, so that's the long point of the skew. Uh, 
right down to solid timber. I'm going to have what we call, um, what do we call it? I've forgotten myself now. A fillet. And a fillet, if you didn't know what a fillet was, a fillet is just a flat section. You'll see it in a lot of architectural turning. Um, and it ends, it sort of becomes um, almost like commas. It stops, it, it pauses the, the design. So from a bead, might go into a fillet, then it might go into a cove, that sort of thing. So it's a transition. It breaks things up a little bit. But I quite like to start, when, when we're on pummels and, and staircase spindles, I like to start with a fillet first, and then, like I say, go into maybe a cove or, or a V-cut, that sort of thing. So I find that really useful. Now, I'm far enough away from this end to go straight into a rough and gouge here, um, and I'm going to work toward that area instead of stopping the lathe, moving myself over, cutting that uh, that uh, pummel in. I'm far enough away and I'm confident enough it's not going to split all the way along the length. So I can cut down just to around, turn up a little bit of speed. If you wanted to know there, I'm at, at the moment I'm running about 1,200, uh, 1,300. We do have a series of knots along here as well, and you'll be very lucky to get away with that with buying timber without having knots in it. So, um, you know, we, we've got to deal with them. A couple of things to take note here. I'm roughing down toward that pummel. As we get close to the pummel, what I'm going to do um, is turn this this the flute of this gouge over. So I'm going to turn, you pop the number four there, Matt, will you? I'm going to pop, turn this flute all the way over. So this area here faces the pummel, and I'm going to just creep into that detail. So I can creep right up to it without touching it. Whereas if I had that flute all the way up like that, there is a likelihood, because I'm cutting down the bottom of the curve, that I'll actually tuck with the cut touch with the top corner so that's why i'm turning right the way over creep into the detail so just down to the solid round And we are going to clean up in a minute, so don't worry. It's not, we're not going to leave it like this. There we are, down to what is almost around. Let's just stop and have a check. So a little tiny flat there and there. Now, we can clean that up in a minute with, with the skew, of course. Uh, yes, Matt, first question. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. Got a question from Cliff. Uh, what drive are you using, and when would you use the Pro Drive over the six prong drive? Yeah. Um, morning, Cliff. Um, so, I'm using a jumbo drive here, size of the timber. So, I want a maximum amount of grip. So, the jumbo drive is a, um, um, like a four prong drive on steroids. Okay. So, much, much bigger. It's around about an inch and a half um, across. So it's a biggie, that one. And a ring center on this side, on the tailstock end. The reason that we're using a ring center is, you know, pine, this particular pine, its summer growth is very soft compared to its winter growth. And if you have a single pointed center, it tends to drift away from those hard um, annual rings into the soft. Um, so that's for that end. Um, maximum drive for that end. When would I go down to... A pro drive and for the next one so the staircase spindle that's exactly what we're going to do we're going to go down to the pro drive and this is a size thing more than anything else um i'm not worried about grip or anything like that because we're not putting a massive amount of pressure on it it's only a small piece of spindle work um so yes that's the reason big jumbo drive there because of physical diameter i'll go down to the small pro um the small pro drive on there pro drive or four prong um, I wouldn't go to a two prong drive. Two prongs really are for uneven surfaces. Two prongs do act like wedges if you hit them too hard um, and they split the timber open. So either a four prong or something like a pro drive. Okay. All right. For a minute, Matt. Yeah. 
So I'm, you, this is my habit. I tend to check constantly that, that things are tight. That's not a bad habit to adapt to or adopt um, into. Um, it, it's just every now and again, I'm just touching, making sure everything's nice and nice and secure still. We're happy with the speed, but just want to make sure nothing's touching the tool rest. I haven't changed the height because we're not changing the job. We're stay, doing the same thing. So that same thing is now um, cutting in the pummel. You may, for instance, have a newel post that has a square section in the middle, so you might have to do four cuts for your pummels and have three pummels in total. It may be that the design um, requires that. So down to solid round. I'm just creeping up to my pencil line. You would, of course... Mark all of your um, newels out, staircase spindles. You mark them all out so the pummels are always in the same place. That's one job taken out of the way for you immediately. So that's done. I can now start thinking about removing that waste. Turn that flute over, so I'm facing the pummel. Right up to the edge. There we are. We're done. Next thing, I'm going to stop the machine. We're going to move over to that last little section in the middle. We'll clean that up, or get it down to round anyway. Checking everything, making sure making sure nothing's touching the tool rest. Not sure whether the camera can pick this up, but as I'm working, you are I am seeing a, a flicker. A vibration about two mil where that that newel is flexing there we are so we're down to an almost round right now we're going to start working up the tail stock end and i'm going to work back from there so i'm going to get my first bit of detail that's going to mean i need to just skew up to that pummel Get a nice clean finish. So I want to give myself a little bit of room from the pummel because I need to go right up to it. Um, I just need to get in close. Tool rest is high. So we're above center with the tool rest um, because we're going to be going on to a skew now. So I want to get up high. Okay. And that minimizes the risk of any catching. Everything's tight again. Lay speed is fine. That's the same. Go to my skew. And... I'm going to support this piece now with my hand. The way I'm going to do that is touch the back of the workpiece. Now, you need to be fairly practiced at spindle turning before you do this. I'm not wearing any clothes here that's going to catch. There are no jumpers, sweatshirts, all that sort of thing. Bare arms, taking off any bangles and bracelets that might might catch. Even my uh, all the rings, my wedding ring, everything comes off when I'm doing this. Um, and any clothes that you might have um, wanting to hang down, just get underneath your smock. So they're out of the way. So nothing can catch. I'm then going to use the skew. But just be mindful all the time of what's happening here. You know, what's going to catch. I'm making sure my fingers aren't gripping the workpiece. My fingers are behind where the timber's coming up. I'm nowhere near the tool rest. And I just gently touch, support the skew with my thumb. run along as i get close into that corner i'm just going to go to the the heel and the heel point so i can get right into the pummel without touching we're almost there already so you can hear those knots having a bit of go, a bit of a go there we are down to the heel into that corner let's do a bit more whilst we're here Mm 
No, we'll just tidy things up a little bit. Okay, still a little bit of a flat. Let's take a bit more out. That's got it. Over our knots. There we are. Let's just have a quick look and see what we're left with. The finish is going to be completely different. You have a much smoother finish there. So you're, the um, the top areas of detail are going to be um, ready to sand, really. I mean, now we're nice and smooth as opposed to nastily torn up like that. It's much easier. So fillet. Let's pop the fillet in. You can use pencil, but just don't mark with a scratch or anything because, of course, these high spots will not be able to be sanded out. Well, you don't want to sand them out anyway. So I'm going to put um, a cove from that point. We're going to go into an OG. And I'm going to put that OG right where those knots are. They're right in the wrong place. So let's just have a take a look and see where we are with those. So I'm going to do that. Bully those knots out of the way. There we go. So curve into an OG. So I want a convex curve here. So heel. And this is like we've done numerous times before on Woodworking Wisdom where we're using the hilt to round the curve over, but then we're going back to the toe of the skew to give us our nice definition at the bottom. Um, and that's something we do quite a lot. Now, on this next section, we're going to come over. We're going to have a bead. And I'm just purposely keeping those knot areas quite large in diameter. The good thing is with these this knots and, and gnarly areas that they're always going to give you a nice decoration. They're always going to have some swirly grain running around them. Most of the time, if you're doing a newel post, you'll have a master to copy. Once you've done one, then you've got your own master anyway, so you'll be fine. Um, this is going to be uh, another little half bead. We're not going too thin with this one. We want to keep some strength to it. So we're down and then a little bit of definition with the toe. Okay, so I'm going to work this section now. So remember, we said this is going to be an OG. So I'm going to go um, down with um, a spindle gouge. I'm going to stop the lathe. I just want to drop that tool rest and get back in nice and close now. There we go. Check security all the time, making sure everything's nice and tight. Right, let's go spindle gouge. You'll get getting a little bit of vibration when there's no bevel rubbing. So if I make that bevel rub, it's fine. But then if I take out the sort of bolts or rough out, then um, then we get a little bit of vibration. So wherever possible, get that bevel engaged. So just now, just getting the finish ready for sanding on this little OG. And I'm using a spindle gouge. Equally as good would be a bowl gouge for this section. I'll show you that on the other end. 
There we are. That's fine. Happy with that. Um, we'll stop the lathe. We'll move the tool rest again. How are we doing, Matt? All right with questions so far? Uh, so we've got a question from Eliza. What speed are you turning at? That was at 1,300. 1,300. Let's just go up. I'm going to skew this section, and then we'll do the next bit of shaping. Uh, I've got another question from Frederick. Yes. Um, he notices in the picture that you're using a steady rest. Um, do you accident to sell them? And could you explain where that one's come from? Yes, I am. We're going to finish this. We're going to get the steady rest done. We're going to do a smaller one, Frederick. All right? So, yeah, well, absolutely. We're going to go for it in a minute. So, just wanted to smash out one of these for you. So, just skew cutting, getting that finished down. As you get closer to your headstock, you'll find that everything will become a little bit easier to work when you're not dealing with knots, of course. There we are. So, right, we can drop the tool rest. We're going to make this a little bit thinner, and we're going to taper down to it. That being the big area where those horrible knots are. Not horrible or not, where those knots are. Um, so a little bit thinner here. So let's go bowl gouge. I'm going to go a little, what are we going to go with? I wanted to go a little quarter inch gouge. Do we have one? No. So we'll go a three eighths. Oh, yeah, there we are. Quarter inch. Not too small, remember. I'm just going to taper down gently. Right, I'm going to go to the top of this this feature, which will be somewhere around those knots. So let's give them a good finish, bit of support for my hands. Don't be afraid of those knots, but be aware of them. That's the best advice I can give you with this. Um, because when you're when you're copying a master, the knots are wherever. You're just going to have to do the detail wherever. You can't avoid them. You're going to have to shape regardless of whether they're there or not. So it's quite important that we can still work with them. Still happy there. We are. I'm going to do a little half bead here. Bit of definition in. Just shove the, the point of your skew in. Right. This is now going to turn into the narrowest area of all. Lay, uh, drop the tool rest. And we're going to take away a little bit with the roughing gouge. And then we can clean up again. So I'm just slowing up now in in terms of my lateral movement with the with the um, roughing gouge. If you think about it, the slower you are, the more rotations over the tool that there is. So it just means that you get a slightly better finish. I have, if a piece has been particularly thin, just come straight off the roughing gouge and, and into a, a slightly coarser grade of abrasive. That works as well. Um, now. I am going to get some vibration here because of those um, knots. So I'm just going to back off from my tool rest a little bit. Um, because of that whip you get, you can suddenly catch the tool rest if you're not careful. So a nice, gentle, slow cut over those knots. There we are. And then I'm just going to finishing cut down to the smaller diameter as you get to smaller diameter the handle has to raise
There we are. Right, now we can go back with our gouge, just clean up. I think we can move on to the next section. Right, the next section, let's just stop the lathe. Bring him, do what we've done on the other side. So what I want to do now is clean this area up right into the pummel. And if I don't do that, then we're going to have a, a bad finish. So I'm just angling the tool rest again. Yes, Matt, what questions do we have? Uh, so we've got a question from uh, Javier. Uh, how wet should the wood be? No, this is bone dry, Javier. Um, it has to be dry if otherwise you're going to get it moving around. Um, so no bone, bone dry. This is straight off the shelf for, for um, uh, sort of joinery. And then there's another question from Sleeping Dog. Um, what method do you use for replacing a master, uh, replicating a master, um, a pin storyboard or some other um, devilishly clever technique? Uh, storyboard. So a little marker, a little bit of um, a little bit of timber here with your pencil marks on. You can then worry about your um, your diameters in two ways. You can either caliper uh, caliper them as you're going along. Um, so just copying the master. Or you could the, you can get them. They're available. People like if you look on Richard's Finley's um, uh, regular streams, you'll see him using fingers, drop fingers, and they're on a bar that fits behind the lathe, and and um, you adjust them to suit the master. And so as you get down to a certain diameter, those fingers then drop down. And there, if you're into a lot of production work, you need something like that. That's going to speed you up no end. But you know, back in the day, it was calipers. That was all we used. All and right. then uh, another question from Frederick. Um, I notice that you're not taking or making any measurements. Is this just experience and what looks right being a fundamental design? Yeah, this is literally just a one-off. If I was um, copying, I would be using um, uh, calipers, so dividers and calipers, um, and a, a little memory board along the back so I would know exactly where. Memory board basically is a bit of um, hardboard or even cardboard at times. You just place on the back and just mark your marks off. So just to speed things up a little bit. Um, and watch those guys. So people like... I'm going to give some names in the UK now. Um, to, must check out if you're into your spindle work. Uh, Richard Finley, Steve Jones, Dave Dolby. Look them up. They've got their YouTube channels. Um, they're masters at production turning and copy turning. And you'll get some magical words of wisdom from those. They stream most of the time. They'll do it at least once a day, if not a couple of times a day. So they're all it, it's separate people. So Richard Finley. Steve Jones, Dave Dolby. So Steve the Wood Turner is his other name. Um, Richard Finley, Dave Dolby. They're magic. Um, so I'm just going to skew up right to that pummel, drop down to my heel, get into the detail. Do the same thing again. There we are. So we're going to have a, a fillet. The fillet's going to be there. We're going to have a bead down here. And this is a, as much as... As much about doing the basics right rather than the whole project and we've spoken all the time about how to roll a bead and you know all that sort of stuff or how to how to cut a v cut and this is the reason we do all of those things v cuts to start your bead a bead is a feature on a spindle and you put them all together and you can start production turning or you can start turning um architectural turnings so um you know, for pieces to go on houses, staircases, those sorts of things. Um, in terms of production turning, the thing there is speed, and speed only comes with practice. That's if you're making a living out of it. Speed comes with practice, and if you don't practice, you're not going to get very good very quickly. A little bit of vibration, so get some support in there. There you go. 
And then that little feature, that little OG here, we'll do that with the... Let's just stop the lathe and drop the tool rest. Uh, we'll do that with the bowl gouge in this one, and I can come a little bit further away from that fillet, of course. There we are. Let's just rough down that last little feature. So we're stop. Just getting that that bevel rubbing to try and minimize some of that vibration because now we're getting into a fairly weak rotary position. There we are, that's better. Right, bowl gouge just to clean up that last little bit. Just circle that in. And I think we're there on that one. Nice and easy, because that one's just out of my imagination. I'm not copying anything, you see, so we can speed it up. Um, and you'll find if you've got a job like this on, each one will become a little bit quicker um, than the last, because you you can see where you can make shortcuts, that sort of stuff. The first one's always a little bit nervy, um, especially if you're doing a big mule or something like that. So there we are. That's just a, giving you an idea of freehand uh, long turning. And there's a reason that I've done that with a, a larger piece than the staircase spindle. You're never going to get a staircase spindle of that length. They tend to range between 900 to 1100. Um, the one I've got here is in between. It's a meter, so it's 1000. Um, so you don't have to worry about going as long normally. If I If I had to do something this long that was that narrow or thin, then it would be absolute the necessity that we go straight to a, um, a steady, okay? But we can get away with it on these bigger mules. I mean, that, even that one, that's a 75, so a three-inch mule. That's still quite a thin mule, really. We're, we're looking at fours and fives most of the time. Let's pop that one down the front of the, the lathe whilst we move on to a, a staircase spindle. I wonder if that... I'll pop that one just there for the minute. We'll get them back up in a minute when we when we do our roundup. Right. So what we need to do is take that tailstock center out. I've got any questions whilst I'm doing this, Matt? I've got a question, got a question from Jim B. Um, what tool do you use when you're making the underside of a mushroom? Round low scraper. Uh, it's the best possible camera for this. Wow, this is a self. Uh, there we go. So just a regular round nose scraper. The only thing to be careful of when you're doing that is not to tilt it. Keep it rested flat on the tool rest. And I'll be honest with you, it's a very common thing because you want to present that tool dead uh, level. It doesn't work. It'd be, if you do it level when you're going in at an angle like that, you're actually tilting away from the tool rest. So you've got to keep it flat on the tool rest, which will actually present that, that tool at a very slight angle. So keep it dead flat on the tool rest. Um, and uh, yeah, you'll be fine. Right, this is a little bit shorter than the last one. So that's going to rest on the pro drive. Tailstock can come up. 
if you're doing a lot of them, make sure you don't bring that tail stock out with, right up without any quill movement. If you've got the quill all the way back in as far as it'll go and you bring the tail stock up, every time you want to change over, you've got to move the tail stock all the time rather than just wind back. Um, so just give yourself a bit of movement there. There we are. Fine. I've already, I sent it up before um, we went live today. So if you're wondering, right, we, we do have an issue on this one. This knot is a problem. So if I was working um, and turning a job with that in it, I would probably save that one to the last and see if I had enough spare to discard. And the reason being, there is a good reason here. Um, that knot is traveling through. So in, in theory, that knot is taking a, a lot of strength, probably about a third of the strength away from that end there. So you've got to be careful of things like that. I will want to try and avoid that. As it happens, uh, staircase spindles, we've got to have a, a – these have got to be cut by the carpenter who's fitting them. So they're going to be – a lot of this end is going to be taken off. I'm going to avoid that. I'm not going to set myself up. So what I'll do is we'll create that pummel above there. I'll measure it. Do the same down the bottom. So there we are. Avoid that problem, can't I? Nine. You get the square. If you can't avoid it, then like I said, leave it to the end. You might be able to discard it. If not, just be really careful because, like I say, it, well, this one won't pop out because it's solid at that side, but you've got nothing. Um, joining it there at all so this is moving all over the place already so a good little test um, we're going to start in exactly the same way we did with the big mule okay we're going to cut those pummels in first lay speed to zero though turn the lathe on and then we can increase the speed same tool Are you okay matt any questions there we are so long point of a skew down go and then back to the roughing gouge So this, the timber that we're using is redwood. Well, that's what it's known by. It's not giant sequoia redwood. This is a, a type of pine, um, and it's used in benchtop joinery. So um, window frames, door frames, staircase spindles, all of those sorts of things. So it's a relatively hard timber in terms of a softwood, in terms of a, a pine. Um, but it's not as hard as, as you know other spindles that you're going to turn for staircases like um, your oaks, your ashes, your beech, um, all of those sorts of things. So you'll get less movement with a hardwood than you will with a soft, but you will still get it. Don't think that you're not going to get any movement with hard, hardwoods. Um, the thinner they go, the more movement you're going to get again. Um, so what we're going to do on here, I'm just going to plane this surface, give us a nice finish. And then we're going to get the steady engaged. Now, the reason I do that is I want this surface here almost almost done, so I don't have to move the steady too much. There we are. That'll do us. Don't sand it yet. It's no point because the steady is going to make a very small indentation. Um, there we are. That's fine. Lathe off. Tourist out the way once the lathe is stopped. In one mount. Now, you were, Frederick was asking, well, where are these available? We sell these um, on our website. So have a look. So we're going to just place them under there, get the wheels out of the way. 
I'm going to screw them up for. I'm not doing anything, any tightening up or anything like that yet. All I'm going to do is just get everything in position. So let's get these wheels right out of the way. Centralize it. All right, it's fairly simple to to um, to join. You've got a plate here on this particular lay that runs perfectly in the middle of the the bed bars. Then you've got an actual capture plate there. So I'm going to pop that on the underside. You're going to see me make all sorts of funny faces now. I expect once I fit this, It'll take long to grab. There we are. Tight. Good. Right, let's get them in place. I want to give myself as much room as possible. It'll be about there. Go. Right now we can start thinking about tightening them up. So what we're going to do is drop down the fingers. All right, nicely supported, nice and tight. Lay speed is zero. So you think now that extra bit of support, we're not supporting here, now we're supporting all the way up here. And this is going to be really, really useful, especially on these really, really thin pieces. So again, I'll cut the other pummel in. Same sort of speed. Here we are. We're rough down to around. Drop the arm a bit more. Nice. All right. Whilst that's nice and secure, I'm just going to give a nice finishing cut to, to this end. I'm away from that pummel. go right let's start our detail let's do a nice fill it in there So if you wanted to put a bit more detail in that spot, you can bring that, uh, bring the, the steady down here a little bit further and then go back to that area. Um, I'm not going to fiddle too much. We're just going to go straight in with our cove.
we are. And then we'll round over a little bit more. a little bit more of that area down the bottom to get away and we, we probably bring up the steady. All right, let's think about our next feature which I'm going to put in here. Now, this is going to be another one of those beads. We'll have a little bit of a half bead before we go into another OG. How are we doing for questions, Matt? Got one from a gentleman, Wood Turner. Um, could you show a lamb's tongue on the top panel? A what? A lamb's tongue. What's a lamb's tongue? What, uh, Come on, Mark. What's a lamb's tongue? I don't know. There we are. What I want to try and do now is just clean up that surface, see what the skew will do. Working nicely. Right, let's just stop that. I think what we'll do now is bring up the bring up the steady again so we can back off our rollers. Has Mark come through yet what the lamb's tongue is? Yeah, so gentlemen when Turner has come back, instead of a straight pommel, it's an OG pommel on the corner. <laughs> no. And also a question from Fuller. On the spindle length, how far from the steady rest can you work? Uh, how far from the spindle length? How far from the steady? How far from the steady rest? On the spindle length, how far from the steady rest can you work? Um, well, I worked right up to about half an inch there, uh, Fuller, um, on that side. I could, if I wanted to work more on this side of it, though, I can bring it uh, up to here and we can sort of swap around. Because it lifts off as opposed to slides on, you can get away with it a little bit more. If you know what I mean? Um, for Mark, we'll do that lamb's tongue on this side then, um, as there's a little bit more support there. Um, just bring my... My wedge over. Also, another question from the uh, gentleman, Wood Turner. Will the steady rest fit the 508? 508. I'm not sure. Let me, I'll, I'll double check that for you. I've got my clamp wedged. Sorry. Um, we'll double check in a minute. 
Um, I want to show you something on on this on the study itself. Yeah, because there are there are several positions that you can put it, Mark. Um, so I can't see why not. Let's bring that up to that point. And what I have, what I'm looking at here, is where this black clamping section is. I've got four bolt positions. We are at... Well, we're at the lower one, actually. All right, so I don't know whether what camera's going to be best out of this. Go back to number four, I think. I don't know whether the camera can pick that up. Oh, maybe number two, then, in that case. You can see the bolt positions here. We're, we've got one, two, we're on the third one, and we've got one more down here. What I'll do is, just, if you email that question in, Mark, um, what I'll do is I'll email it back. Okay, we'll, we'll do a bit of research and find out exactly what it takes. All right, so drop the fingers, the arms. These are nylon, almost like skateboard wheels, actually. There we are. And I'll do one more little feature here. So we'll do the same as what we've done up the other side. Do a little bead. to our OG, so half bead. And then our fillet. a little bit more. There we are. That's better. That's much better. There we are. I think we could do a bit better up here, actually. Going to go to a spindle gouge. For Mark, we've got our lamb's tongue pummel done, Mark. Thank you. Um, so there we are. That was just a little bit of an explanation on the long turnings, um, steady rests, and architectural turning. Are we any questions, Matt? So uh, gentleman Wood Turner has said, I owe Colwyn a pint now for being a pain. <laughs> you owe me several, Mark. <laughs> no, not at all. This is what we're all about. It's important that we get all these questions um, asked. And it's important that we cover them. Um, there we are. So we've got two bits of turning going on there. We've got a nice little staircase spindle, one of 
you think about you're doing for a staircase or any one staircase, you're probably doing about a hundred staircase spindles at best. Um, if you're doing a big staircase, then you're doing a lot more. What I like about this is this is what keeps us in business as wood turners. You can go to all the big warehouse um, DIY stores and you can buy packs of 10, 20, 100 spindles, but they are what you got, get given. What they can't do is reproduce in the smaller number um, what the wood turner can. So if you're trying to copy an old staircase or a certain design, it's us that that do that if you give the job to the big boys on the cnc lays they're only interested in the big numbers we get those smaller jobs so the the regular staircases you know your hundreds your 150s that sort of stuff and the same with bespoke new posts um it's the only likes of us that are going to be do it going to be doing these sorts of things um the rest uh, are left to no choice you just don't get the choice when you have to buy off the shelf so i hope that's helped are we good? Go on, let's just do a few more questions before we finish. I got another question from Brian. Is the spindle rest made from aluminium? No, it's solid steel. Good old. It's, it's a, there's a weight to it, this one. Um, so no, steel with nylon nylon wheels. Um, but yeah, solid cast. Welded together, piece of kit. <laughs> right then, guys. Well, if... Now, I'm off tomorrow to... Um, in the evening off to Gloucester to see the boys up in, in uh, Hucklecote and um, and do a demo for them. And then I'm there as uh, doing a masterclass also on the Thursday. So I look forward to seeing you guys up in Gloucester uh, tomorrow and Thursday. And um, apart from that, I, I think we're there pretty much. Until next time, thank you very much for dropping by. And don't forget to like, um, give us a thumbs up, subscribe, all those things. And um, and stay tuned for Thursday, of course, when I, go, I can't remember who we've got on Thursday. It'd be Ben or Jason, one of us. Um, and if anybody's going to go up to uh, Birmingham to see uh, Maker Central, stop by and and, uh, and say hi to all the guys up there. Again, uh, Jason and Ben are going to be there. Um, so come and say hello. And um, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.